Hello. Hello. So I, uh, so I wanted my um, conversation to be entertaining, but it's going to be difficult after that. So, <laughs> but, but, but I'll try. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Siddhant. Um, it was a very kind introduction. Uh, we're still in our pilot, but there's, and there's a lot more work to do. But basically, yeah, I work with waste pickers, rag pickers in India, and we try and empower them both socially and financially. Uh, and today, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I see um, you know, social entrepreneurship as and how technology can really be a catalyst for change in India. Uh, so I was born and brought up in Pune. Um, I, um, growing up, I really liked uh, working on different projects, I would, um, you know, I mean, most of them didn't really make any sense, um, and very few of them would actually work, but I was always tinkering with something or coding something. Uh, and for me, what was most important uh, when I was doing those projects was just the, just the thrill of a problem and then solving it. And that, that was a huge, uh, you know, adrenaline rush for me. Um, I was fortunate enough to get into a good college, and when I was there, um, I, uh, I worked on a project in uh, Tanzania over a summer where we were working with a tribe. So I was living in with the tribe for an entire summer. Uh, and the semester before that, we focused on uh, actually designing a solution for a problem that they were facing. And that was the first time that um, one of my projects actually had a human element to it. Before then, you know, I would make you know, maybe an app or maybe like, you know, a robotic car or something like that. But uh, this, that was the first time where um, one of my projects, the problem included a human variable. And uh, the interesting thing to me is that problems that include human variables are the most complicated to solve, but also by far the most fulfilling. And so it was a really great experience. I mean, we, that project finally failed, by the way. But, um, but just working there for, um, for the entire summer, you know, talking to them, actually understanding them. Also understanding how a developing country that wasn't India uh, looked like uh, was, uh, was very educational. So I just wanted to touch a little bit, I mean, a few of the speakers touched a little bit on what a social enterprise was, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what, you know, what I thought it was. And basically, any enterprise can be a social enterprise if it involves the human element that I spoke of. I mean, most companies do this. You know, you create jobs, you could be a social enterprise. You, you know, raise wages, you can be a social enterprise. But the driving theme behind a lot of social enterprises is basically a sustainable business model that, impa that positively impacts some community. So just to give you a few examples of people I know who are in this space, uh, you know, there, there are groups in Bombay that, um, that basically what they do is that if the average, you know, tuition cost is 1,000 rupees per month, they'll offer tuitions for 200 rupees per month. You know, they'll basically just do it at cost, so it's like a non-profit. And so the, ben the social benefit of that is that a lot of students who don't have access to these higher tuition classes get the same education at a lower cost. They still make money from this, from this enterprise, but it still qualifies as a social enterprise because one of the driving motivators was social change. Uh, you know, there are other organizations that work with, um, you know, sanitation, health, a lot of other, you know, it could be any different, any community. But basically, the way I, I define a social enterprise is that if you have the human element in mind, and if you are positively trying to impact that human element, then you have a social enterprise. So why, why is technology a powerful tool for, uh, for social enterprise and social empowerment in India? So, I mean, I've traveled a decent amount, and the thing that blows my mind about India is that you'll see, like I was just in Mumbai, I just came back, um, like, like last night actually, and you'll see these huge like 30-story skyscrapers overlooking like, you know, kilometers of slums, right? And you'll see, you know, you'll see different religions, you'll see different castes, you'll see different beliefs, you'll see different gods. So all this, like, it's crazy. There's so much chaos, right? And everyone, like, everyone in this room probably believes some, in some different god and some different ritual and his mother has told him something else or her something else. I mean, it's crazy, right? But at the end of the day, the country still works. Like, we've been, the country's been working with all this thing still going on. And that blows my mind. And in, in a way, it's, it's bad because, like, you look at it and you look at the disparity between like, you know, sitting on that 35th story of a skyscraper and looking at slums, sometimes you feel why, like, why, why is there such a difference? And that's obviously a bad thing. But in a way, it's a good thing because a lot of developing countries 
I mean, India is unique in the sense that it has this extremely high-tech, talented workforce, and at the same time, it has all this social opportunity, a lot of low-hanging fruit. And the, where I see technology come into play is that, well, let's say we're on the road and we see something that we think is silly. Like, like, why is he doing that? Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? And if you take that, if you take that same train of thought one step further, why is he doing that? It doesn't make any sense. What can be done differently? There are so many things that can be done differently in India. So in a sense, it's actually easier to enact change in India because there's so much to change. Like anywhere you look, like I guarantee you walk out of that gate, there is a problem that you'll be able to see in the first 10 minutes. You look at it, you'll be like, okay, this is a problem. This can be more efficient. This can be better done. I can devise a solution for it. And that's crazy, right? Because that, is, that means there's so much opportunity. Like we can all walk out of here and make new businesses today. And I think that for me, that's like very inspirational because and where technology plays a role is that, like, let's say we actually do that. Let's say we actually go out and we see these problems, and now we want to devise solutions. We are in like Hinjavari, which is like this huge tech park. So we just walk up to people who actually like trained engineers, talented engineers, you know, talented doctors, talented you know, activists, and we, we we actually understand the problem. So we have we have the opportunity and we have the potential for a solution, and. That to me is like a unique thing. Like, I mean, I think that's amazing. So something that I, that I wanted to touch on. Uh, taking it a step further, so my, my work uh, it focuses on using 3D printing. So that's the technology side. And then we also work with vase pickers. So that's what I was talking about, the low-hanging fruit side. Um, so let me just give you a short overview of what 3D printing is. Uh, let's say you had to make a wooden ball. You'd probably start with like a big block of wood and then carve it, right? So it's subtractive manufacturing. Basically, you take more and then you, you, you cut it out until you get less. 3D printing is the opposite, where it's additive. So in 3D printing, you basically start with nothing and then you would, for instance, extrude the ball. So you'd only use as much material as the ball needed. I don't want to go too much into what like the intricacies of 3D printing are, but the point is that it is an extremely good prototyping technology that could help a lot of architectural students, engineering students, and that kind of thing. But it is still a little too expensive for mainstream adoption. And so that, that has like two, two so then I, we were thinking of like two problems, right? On the one hand, there's this community, this, this community of waste pickers that I don't know how many of you, so I've, I lived in Pune my entire life before I went to college. And um, I'd never been to a garbage dump. I mean, I come from a middle class family. You know, I, I, was, I lived a comfortable life. Uh, and you know, we, we have a tendency to walk on the road. You see people begging. You, you're, you're very desensitized to all, the, all of that stuff, right? Like, by the end of those 18 years, you, you know that they're there, but you don't actually know that they're there. At least that, that's what happened to me. But then um, I took four years out, right? Because I wasn't in India for four years. And when you come back, you realize that there's so much stuff you take for granted, and there's so much stuff that can be changed and needs to be changed. But there's also so much that you could do for it. Like, I'm, everyone in this room has a connection to someone that could help someone else in India. And I think that is amazing. That is not true everywhere in the world. But that is true in India. Because there's so many people that need help, but there's so many people that can help. Now, getting back to like what, what I do, so I went to the garbage dump because I wanted to see it, and uh, you know we saw waste pickers, and I mean they're extremely, extremely hardworking people, um, and they basically what they do is that they go through garbage dumps and they collect plastic waste, and currently the process is that they take that plastic waste and then they sell it to a scrap dealer, and they get you know a certain amount of money for the work that they do. At the end of the day, they earn about 50, 60 rupees. Can you imagine spending your entire day going through garbage, like waste garbage, right? This is like health, like, you know, old stuff from the hospital, broken glass, they're rats, dogs, like it's, it's very, very taxing work. And these are extremely hardworking people, but even then, spending your entire day going through that garbage and then getting 50 rupees for it, right? So, we, I saw that, and I had no experience with this community before, but uh, I just thought, you know, maybe, Maybe we can add value to that plastic that they collect. So we started thinking about how we can add value to the plastic that they collect. And um, one thing that struck us at the time, I was working with my father on this actually, 
uh, was, you know, what about 3D printer filament? Just like a 2D printer has an ink cartridge, a 3D printer, a 3D printer has a filament spool. So we, we wondered if we could just make the filament spool. And so, you know, we Googled it and uh, nobody made recycled filament. So we're like, okay, we don't know anything about this, but, you know, I have some free time. Let's try. So we tried and we failed. We failed, like, for the first four months, but it was fine because it was just a side project. So it didn't really matter. You know, we, we kept trying. Eventually, we succeeded. So eventually, we took a waste bottle and we created filament with it. At that point, we decided, okay, maybe this is the way to add value to the plastic. So we went to this waste picker cooperative called Swatch, which is in Pune. Uh, you're all welcome to visit. We are based in Kothrud, by the way. So, and they do amazing work. They're completely independent of what we do. They're a waste picker cooperative. They do great, great work um, in organizing waste pickers. Um, and so we went to them and we asked, um, you know, if they wanted to work with us. And um, I mean, so initially it was, it was a little difficult just explaining, right? Because even now I'm sure like you have a lot of questions, like what does this mean? Like how does this work, right? So it's difficult to explain how this, this works. But we explained it. And um, like I said, they're very entrepreneurial. They're very hardworking. They said, you know, let's let's try. So I mean, it took took a while, but we set up a filament pilot uh, setup, and you know, that's where we are currently. You know, it's been eight months since then, and it, things are going well. I mean, there are obviously issues with like people asking, government officials asking for bribes, and you know, other permissions issues. And I mean, there are a lot of you know issues that you deal with, but uh, at the end of the day, we just by just by applying some like technological solution that I had come across to a, a population that I had also come across. I, and like I said, we're still far away from being successful, but I have the potential to bridge that gap, right? And I think, I think that, and that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like there's so many different opportunities like that. So I'm just gonna skip this because I wanted to focus on, yeah. So, I mean, basically, this is just the overview of what we do, right? So we, we take the, so in this case, the waste pickers process the filament, and then it goes global. And the point I'm, I'm making here is that in the increasingly globalized world we live in, there's so much opportunity to use our local resources, to use our local communities to solve a global demand problem. I mean, we talk about like market-driven solutions, right? Like, what is more market-driven than recognizing that you have a need for a product and recognizing a community that is the best suited to create that product. And again, I'm trying to emphasize that like you, everyone here, like we could all, like everyone can walk out and do just that. You recognize a demand for a product and recognize a community that can make that product. And if you, if you do that, that's, that's social entrepreneurship right there, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the number of waste pickers. Again, I think this is something that, like, we don't really understand because, you know, we live in India, like, like we're sitting in an AC auditorium right now. And, uh, you know, we drive our cars and we see, you know, we see people on the road, but we don't really stop and think about how many of them are, they are, there are. And there are two million, at least, at least, in India. Uh, and that's a huge number, right? So, obviously, what I'm... What we're doing with them is not like it can't help everyone, right? Maybe it'll help only 5,000 people, 10,000 people. But there is the opportunity to help a lot more people if we all use like market driven approaches to do that. And which is why I think social entrepreneurship is hugely valuable. Um, just to go into a little bit of the technical side, um, I mean, this is the value add. And again, this is, I want to emphasize the power of technology. I don't want to focus specifically on any of the stuff we do so much as the power that technology has in taking something that is traditionally looked at as low value, in this case, plastic. Like, so I, I, they're in dollars right here, but pl plastic is sold approximately for like 15 rupees to 20 rupees per kilogram, right? That's what you, that's what a waste picker would. If I go collect plastic and go, that's what I would get, right? But if I take that same plastic and convert it to a filament, that's huge. That's a huge value add. Right. So if 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 you can if you can and, and but the technology itself, like sure, it took us some time to develop it, but it's not rocket science. Like it's very simple technology. So if you like by by using simple technology, you have taken something that was traditionally low value and made it extremely high value, and that in a margin, some of it can go to you because you did the work, so you should you should get the benefit. But a large chunk of it is going to go to that community that you work with. And that's what's beautiful about social entrepreneurship is that it's purely sustainable. You don't need to go apply for grants. You don't need to do any of that. If this works, we're sustainable. 
Um, I just wanted to also touch on the, again, I mean, I'm talking about 3D printing, but I want to more talk about in general technology. And when you, when you innovate, there, there are always these secondary benefits of the technology, right? In the case of 3D printing, I don't know how many of you here uh, are engineers or architects or like, you know, art or design or that kind of thing. But my guess is that it's a re reasonable number. And a lot of you have had to do projects. And imagine if you had the ability to print what you were making, what you had in your head. Like you had this thing in your head and you're like, man, that would be great if I could only print it and show it to someone. I have this great idea for this product, but I, I can't explain how it looks. But I can just sit on my computer, I can CAD it up and print it. And then I can give it to an investor and he can feel it. That's the beginning of your product design company, right? And so again, I don't want to talk, and, the, and, that, and every technology like 3D printing has these benefits. And the point I'm trying to make is that my goal may not have been to empower architects or empower engineers, right? The goal was to try and work with these waste pickers. But if you use a market-driven solution, which is what social entrepreneurship does, by definition, there is a demand for it, which means that you are also empowering and also benefiting these other communities. In this case, th those communities are architects, engineers, designers, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I already touched on this, but basically, you know, we, we're in our pilot and uh, we're not we're far from being successful yet, but uh, I don't want to talk too much about this, but basically, I did want to say, I did want to touch on the fact that sometimes the problem with technology driven solutions is you can do them in isolation. So you don't want to sit and think about the technology to help, like let's say you want to help fishermen, you want to actually be with the fishermen when you're trying to design something for them. You don't want to sit in your lab, design something and then go give it to the fishermen because I've done that in Tanzania and it didn't work. I sat in a lab, I designed this thing that I thought was great and I was like, man, you know, great engineer. but. I went to Tanzania, so it was, it was designed on pedal power, so it required, them to, to, it required people in the village to have bicycles. And I went to the village, and nobody had bicycles. <laughs> so, like, that was like a wasted, you know, if I just spent time with actually including the community, that, that solution could have been much better. So I just wanted to, the reason I brought this up is because I just wanted to, like, touch on the fact that, you know, you have to be inclusive in, in social entrepreneurship. Uh, and again, I'm running out of time, but basically, I, again, I, recycled filament is not the solution, but it could be a part of a much larger solution. The emphasis should be on market-driven solutions that are inclusive. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to end on, um, on the fact that at the, in my mind, at the end of the day, the best way to make progress is to be inclusive of both, um, you know, the fact that we have all these crazy technology solutions coming out, but also the fact that there are communities in India that are extremely hardworking and are just waiting to be included in the solution. Thank you.